Hello Lords and Ladies of the Internet, I'm the King of Candor, and today we'll be discussing the history of ogres and fantasy. Now, there are a few things to note before we get started. First, go ahead and subscribe for more fantasy content, and second, ogres do not have as clear of an origin as there are hundreds of ogre-like creatures from across the world, so I'm going to have to set up a few ground rules for what an ogre is. Ogres are large humanoids with a build like that of a normal human, who are less intelligent than that of humans, but also enjoy eating humans. With these parameters in mind, we can quickly go over some ogres across the world before we end with what is commonly given as the origin of what we call ogres. Starting in Japan, ogres here are called oni, and they are hulking figures with horns on their heads. The skin is usually a red, blue, or a black, yellow, white color. They also use an iron combo clump, and wear loincloths of a tiger pelt, with many of them also casting spells. Within the South Africa, amongst the sand bushmen, we see the agamaksa, who are large humanoids that eat other humans, and they hunt by laying down in the sand. They don't have eyes on their head, but on their feet, meaning they must run on their hands, which is kind of goofy. In Sumeria, we have a specific ogre named Humbaba, who must be slain by Gilgamesh and Enkidu, the original Gigachads. In North America, the Shoshone have the Diavatsits, which is a massive monster who once stole the sun, eats children, and is responsible for volcanoes. That should just show how widespread these types of myths are. Over time, ogres also mix with things like the Greek Cyclopses, the Jotun and Giants from the Norse, and even trolls found throughout Europe to make a strange mix of large, angry creature. These creatures and their words are mostly interchangeable until, though, we get the first written use of the word ogre in the 12th century. It's one of the founding tales from King Arthur's court called Percival in the story of the ground. Here it is noted that ogres once owned the land of England and Wales, before being driven out by King Arthur and the humans he led. The word ogre has a similar etymological root to the word orc, the Etruscan god of death Orcus, who fed on human flesh. This connection is expanded upon by J.R.L. Tolkien and Tom Shippey in their research and writings, and they connect it to a deeper cross-cultural origin in Indo-European societies in the past. I cover this further in my History of Orcs video, linked here. From here, Ogres pop up in several stories until they're popularized by one author, Charles Perrault. Charles Perrault is one of those most famous authors you've never heard of. He wrote several fairy tales and collected some of the folk tales into his seminal work, The Tales of Mother Goose. You might also know a few of his more popular stories, such as Cinderella, Bluebeard, which I touched upon in my vampire video link here, Sleeping Beauty, Puss in Boots, and Little Red Riding Hood. Before he wrote any of these works, though, Charles Perrault collected a large amount of the folk tales into a novel called Stories or Tales from Pastimes, which included the tale Hop Me Thumb, and Hop Me Thumb is about a small boy named Little Thumb whose parents abandoned him and his siblings in the forest to die. This fails at first with Little Thumb placing stones on the way home. The second time was less successful since Little Thumb used bread which all the birds ate. They wander the forest until they find an ogre who lets him stay in his home and in his daughter's room. While in the room, Little Thumb switches his siblings' hats with the crowns the daughters are wearing, and when the ogre enters the room to kill the kids, he kills his daughters by accident, thinking they were Little Thumb and his siblings. In the morning, a chase at Zeus, with Little Thumb escaping, and the ogre falling asleep after chasing them for a while. He then steals the ogre's shoes, which are magical, and allow Little Thumb to travel fast, which somehow earns him a fortune, and Little Thumb returns to his family. Ignoring the fact that his parents tried to kill him somehow, and they live happily ever after. The story was also adopted later into Hansel and Gretel by the Brothers Grimm, so maybe you could add that to the list of stories inspired by Charles Perrault. The tale of Hop Me Thumb set the world on fire in the 17th and 18th century, with many people being inspired by the ogre character and writing their own ogre fictions. During this time, ogres occupy a solid role as murderers and man eaters with a fondness for eating children. Ogres really didn't change much until they were added to Dungeons and Dragons. Ogres predate D&D, actually, as they were in the original Greyhawk supplement, with a special ogre variant called the Ogre Magi being added. Now, base ogres act like how you'd expect for them, but the Ogre Magi took influence of the Japanese Oni I mentioned earlier and could cast spells such as Fly and Polymorph and Become Invisible. This is the first time Western fantasy gave ogres magic, as before, Ogres may have had magic items, but could not cast spells. Side note, ogres all wear furs and rags, except the ogre magi, who are known as wearing an oriental-style clothing, which I find hysterical. They get a little bit smart and immediately become weebs. 
So, as D&D developed, they were lumped in with many other species of the giant kit, and eventually, the Ogre's Lord developed from this to make a new version of them called the Marrow, which lives underwater and was stronger and more aggressive than regular Ogres. Now on to the Half Ogre real quick. Gary Gygax hated this and only made this race to satisfy player requests to play an Ogre. Like I mentioned in the Orc video, when Half Ogres were dropped, their best traits got mixed in with the Half Orc to increase the strength of them. Ogres being large makes them very interesting foes, but that's a bunch of complicated problems for players, which is why they're dropped in most editions of D&D. From here, the Ogres once again stagnate with very few changes to them. They're made more ferocious eaters instead of pure man-eaters, but they stay as villains until a children's comic artist decided to use them in his story. William Stegg sat down to write a comedy book for kids about an ugly monster leaving home and marrying an even uglier princess. This was Shrek! with an exclamation mark. And it was to become a modest hit until it was adapted into a 2001 film by the same name. Everyone knows the Shrek film. I won't do a summary on it, but I will note that the original story, Shrek could breathe fire. This is the height of Ogres, a high which I doubt they will ever achieve again. Since this film, Ogres have become green and associated with swamps and onions, something they didn't have before. Ogres were always gross creatures, but the film plays this up to a comedic level with things like candles made from earwax. Shrek and the memes about him have also permanently made Ogres and Onions link, which I find fascinating due to the Ogres French roots. The French actually have a battle song, which I'll link below, about how much they love onions, something Shrek will be proud of. From here, Ogres don't change much. Lots of franchises have minor differences between their Ogres, but at their core, they're still large, dumb, gluttonous, cannibalistic brutes, with the smart ones doing magic. Thank you for watching this far. If you enjoyed the content, I'd appreciate it if you liked and subscribed. I look forward to your candor in the comments below. Have a great day.